to get into it. Uh, I'm ready, my end there, guys. That's great, John. So we are live now, and people are joining us. Good morning, as you're joining us this morning. Uh, we're just going to allow a couple of moments. We have a lot of people uh, joining this webinar this morning, a lot of interest in it. So we'll just give it another moment or two to allow everyone time to log in. Uh, good morning to you as you're logging in. Uh, we do have a, a large number of people joining us this morning, so we're just going to allow another moment just to make sure everybody gets in before we make a start. Okay. Good morning and thank you for joining us this morning. You're very, very welcome to the latest in our series of webinars with our legal uh, patrons, Mill Selig. Uh, this morning's topic is quite a sobering one, but a really important one, obviously, in our sector on fatal accidents in the workplace and what to do in those unfortunate circumstances. Um, I'd like to thank Mill Selig for their support. We've had a, a great number of webinars so far this year. We have more to come. Uh, we have one next month on time-related claims. And when we meet again in January, we'll be looking at energy projects. So a great lineup from Mill Selig. We're very grateful to them for their support throughout the year. I'm going to introduce you now to Kirsch McGee, who is partner of litigation at Mill Selig. And Kirsch, thank you very much for giving your time this morning. You're very welcome. And we look forward to your, your presentation. So I'll hand over to you. I would just say in terms of housekeeping, uh, we would welcome Q&A. Best way to do that, please, is using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And you could su submit questions there, which we will pick up at the end. And obviously, it's, it's, a, it's an important topic, but a sensitive topic. So by all means, those questions are, are anonymous. It's just important to uh, discuss the issues. So no more ado. I'll hand over to Kirsten. Thank you very much. And we'll see you at the end as well. Thank you, Kirsten. Thanks, Mark. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, nice to have you here. Like I am um, obviously from Scotland, if you can tell from my accent, but I have been here for about 13 years now. Um, the early part of my career was spent acting for the Scottish Prison Service. Um, and during that time, I pretty much exclusively was dealing with deaths of custody. Um, those are one of the circumstances in which there would be a fatal accident inquiry in Scotland, which is the equivalent of our coronial inquest in Northern Ireland. And so, so that's my background. Um, I also dealt with a significant number of catastrophic injury or fatal uh, claims uh, on, on a civil basis. Um, but since moving over to Northern Ireland, um, I've had more of a commercial focus. Uh, so I, I would act for employers, site owners, manufacturers of plant machinery in coronial inquests in this jurisdiction. Um, and I also support them through the health and safety executive investigation process, which can be fairly cumbersome. Um, and also support them at the end of what is a fairly lengthy process that we'll go through this morning. And uh, once we get to any civil claim that results from the circumstances of the death. So um, the, moving on just a little, a little bit about Mill Selig. Yes, that's the sales pitch. Here we are. Um, you know, we, we're a full service commercial firm, but today we're going to focus on this very specific and as Mark said, a rather somber subject matter. Uh, so here's an overview um, of what, what we're going to go through. Now, as a litigator, I tend to deliver training to clients, um, which involves an element of fear, uh, usually the fear of being sued. Um, but the consequences of failing to keep on top of health and safety can really be devastating. There's a real human element to this as well. You know, so some of you will have experienced what, what it's like to deal with a workplace fatality and it's obviously a, a horrible experience for everyone involved um, but many of you won't have but look at unfortunately they, they do occur 
um, and in particularly as as Mark said, um, your own industry uh, is is an industry where deaths do do, do happen more frequently, perhaps, than, than in under other industries. Um, so, look, the the health and safety executive's annual report um, for twenty twenty one did show a decrease in fatalities in in major industries. Um, probably due to COVID and people just not being physically in workplaces. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that that, you know, as people start to get back into, into things, um, that, that that will possibly creep up again. And that what we're going to look at today are the sort of key issues in the immediate aftermath of an incident of this nature. What do you need to have in your mind and what do we need to think about doing? We're going to look at um, what's involved in the health and safety NI investigation process, um, the PSNI investigation, which which tends to be something that overlaps with the HSE investigation, what that can involve, um, the coronial inquest process, which is very likely to take place following a death in a workplace. Um, any civil proceedings to follow, and then we'll we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. So the key issues in the immediate aftermath of a death, what is it you have to think about right away? Well, the first thing is obviously, who do you have to alert? And obviously just not even as a, a matter of law, but just a matter of common sense, you have to alert the emergency services. Um, now, this is something that we try to teach children about and we talk about in schools and things, but it's worth reinforcing with your own staff you know, who it is it who would have responsibility to dial 999 in, in the event of an emergency? Um, it's worth just going through those processes internally and, and making sure people are confident as to who, who has responsibility for that. Um, it's really important that um, you know that you have to report these types of incidents to the health and safety executive. Um, I mean, the, the legislation which governs that body makes it an offence not to advise them of a death or an injury in a timely manner. Um, and in, in the case of a fatality, they tend to come on the scene immediately as soon as they're notified. So again, who's responsible for making this call? Um, and most of my clients have a health and safety manager or designated health and safety officer um, who would be responsible for that, but that's important. That you go through with your people you know who, who's going to deal with that now this sounds a bit crass unfortunately but yes it's important that you get in touch with your legal advisors just as early as possible uh, now there can be a flurry of activity and demands from various agencies when something like this happens uh, and again at the end of the day you want to put your best foot forward um, there are further offenses involving failure to comply with requests for information or you know failing to facilitate the investigation or disclose certain information. So look, it's important to have clear advice at a really early stage, as early as possible. Um, another sort of more practical point, first aid, you know, Im important to make sure that you have first aiders, that people know what they're supposed to do, um, check that training is up to date. Um, look, it can be fairly traumatic for other members of staff who witness an incident of this nature, but it, I think it's made worse if they feel that they didn't know what to do and they, that they couldn't, they didn't have any opportunity to help in any way. Um, so that's something worth thinking about. Um, whoever is responsible for health and safety in your organisation should really be thinking about starting their own investigation as soon as, uh, and that can involve taking photographs, um, speaking to the staff involved, making sure that all records are retained, for example, any CCTV footage, anything that could be relevant to the investigation. Um, managing the press, you know, they're, they're often, especially in a small jurisdiction like this, um, you, you will get press interest in, in any sort of death in, in uh, a workplace. So it may be that you have a press agency that you work with um, on other less sober matters, um, but they, um, they might be able to assist you or your solicitor could um, assist in putting together wording, um, which kind of just holds the line and expresses sympathy, but doesn't sort of say anything really about the circumstances of the death. Um, that can lead on to the family liaison. Um, often I find that clients are quite anxious about being in touch with the family. Um, which is totally understandable um, and it's very sensitive, but it can be done 
sensitively and I think it for again the sort of human element of all this it it is important that that, that is done um and we don't all sort of close ranks and uh say nothing because at the end of the day you know there's a there's always a family um left behind here uh, also important to think about pastoral care for your other staff um it, these things can be very very difficult for people who witness the incident or the aftermath of the incident or just people who knew the individual involved so I think it's sensible to look at bringing counsellors in for a session to speak to people who've been involved thinking about some compassionate leave um, now unfortunately as we'll see when we get on to some of these case studies the legal process can be really lengthy um, and staff might well be involved as witnesses for for a number of years so just be mindful of the impact of sort of dredging it all up because it tends to go in sort of peaks and troughs. You'll have a lot of activity, then it can go quiet for months and months. And then you may find that you've been asked to revisit your statement or speak to someone um, about what happened. And look, it's it's just important to be mindful of, of the impact that that has on your people. Um, now, the investigation of the HSE conduct um as i said usually commences immediately uh, they act sort of alongside the psni um, the, the hse's role is is basically as a public body responsible for the promotion and enforcement of health and safety at work standards in northern ireland and i'm sure you come across their um a lot of their publications in your in your day-to-day lives um, and a lot of their sort of advertising around various risks and so that that's the sort of promotion side of it what we're really thinking about today is their enforcement role uh, they do share responsibility with local councils um, but i think most of the businesses represented here today will fall within the health and safety executive remit they're responsible for factories and building sites and construction whereas the local council sort of look after retail leisure and that sort of thing um, HSE officers will attend on site. They will speak to senior people in the first instance to try and get a handle on, on what's going on. Um, they will interview staff. Um, they, that can take a long time to be arranged. Um, the interviews can go on for, for a number of months, um, particularly so during the pandemic, where obviously the HSE have had quite a, a pull on their resources in terms of implementing new procedures and assisting people to, to do that and to comply with the new regulations and also to make sure people are complying with the new regulations. Um, so the, the, that has just added to the sort of backlog. So again, it can all take, can all take a, a good amount of time. Um, in, in an incident where there has been a piece of machinery or plant um, involved, generally what happens is that 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 specific item is, is taken away for, for forensic examination, um, which is understandable, but can, you know, can cause operational issues that you might want to think about in advance. Um, the inspector dealing with the incident will quite quickly produce a very, very lengthy wish list of documentation. Um, and I mean, they can go on and on, but generally they're looking for all risk assessments, policies, procedures, training records, maintenance records that are relevant to the incident. They can also ask for CVs for members of staff, roles and responsibilities for you know, company structures, all sorts of information. And the list goes on really. That, that process is very time consuming and demanding, but it's also very important. Um, you know, it's very important that, as I mentioned previously, there are penalties for failing to cooperate, failing to disclose relevant information. Um, and so it's something that, that you really should take advice on um, as, soon as, as soon as you can. In terms of um, enforcement, um, sorry, John, I've gone backwards there. Yeah, and again, in, in terms of enforcement, the, the Health and Safety Executive have got a number of tools at their disposal. Um, they can issue a, an improvement notice, which is basically where there has been a breach of health and safety standards. Um, and the notice requires that that breach or the matters giving rise to the breach be remedied. So it's fairly self-explanatory. It's sort of giving you an opportunity to fix whatever the problem is. Um, prohibition notice directs you to stop carrying out an activity which has been deemed to involve a risk of serious injury. Now, these can be quite sort of contentious um, and quite subjective. So obviously in the aftermath of a, of a death, um, if you receive a prohibition notice 
which asks you to stop doing something um, that deemed to be very unsafe. Um, and you, you know, it, 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 there, there's obviously a, a suggestion there that, that that process may have contributed to the death that's just occurred. So um, we have experience of appealing against those notices where we feel that the, the officer has just got the wrong end of the stick and they've gone down a, a route that's, that's not correct because you're mindful that you don't want that created in the minds of the family or the public as a as the you know the cause of the incident so um it can it can be subjective but it's um it is it can be also problematic where whatever the activity involved is something that's key to your operations um so if you're you're told not to do something that you that's sort of business critical then then we have to take action on your behalf to sort that out um the health and safety executive can take forward their own prosecutions for breaches of health and safety standards, usually the less serious breaches. Again, can be a painfully slow process, as you'll see from the dates in the case study. Um, everyone's interested in the level of fines and the penalties that can be imposed. So I'm about to breach one of my own rules about giving seminars where um, I will not ever list uh, legislation and make people read it because it's so dull, but I'm going to break that rule myself here um, and let you see. So penalties for lower level offences, um, breaches of the improvement order or prohibition notice, uh, lower courts, magistrates courts, £20,000 fine and or six months imprisonment. Now that's the bit that always peaks interest um a lot of these offenses can you know can involve a custodial sentence um, and that would be imposed on a business owner in a smaller organization perhaps a director there would have to be direct culpability on the part of that director but um it is uh, you know it does raise the eyebrows when you look at it the higher courts can impose an unlimited fine um under two years imprisonment um moving on to sort of the what, what people will be familiar with in terms of very general health and safety at work law which is the the ni order it gives you know sets out these general duties of employer to look after their workers and other people who may be uh, on their premises um again that no custodial sentences here thankfully but um twenty thousand pounds in your lower courts unlimited fine in the higher courts and finally um which is other general breaches, uh, you know, this looks like sort of de minimis, £5,000, but what you'll see is that that's per breach, so it can actually quickly add up um, if there are multiple breaches of different um, orders or pieces of legislation, then it can it can quickly add up to a much more significant figure. And again, High Court has an unlimited um, fine, ability to fine. So just to look at a quick case study um, this is this is a case that was reported back in in may of this year uh, and it involved the prosecution of a building contractor um, based in bangor following the death of a worker on a house building site um, so the the investigation by the hse commenced in june 2018 so if you note the time between um, the incident and the court hearing which was 2021 um, that's pretty much three years. Um, the, the, the case involved a 46-year-old man who fell about 2.8 metres through an opening on the first floor where a staircase was, was due to be installed. Um, he later sadly died of, of his injuries. Um, the company had placed trestles and barrier tape to mark out and prevent access to the stairwell, um, but it was held that those were not sufficient measures. Um, there was no risk assessment carried out and they had failed to plan, manage and monitor the construction phase of the build. So you can see the various breaches just listed there. Um, breach of Article 5.1 of the Health and Safety at Work order, um, that resulted in a £10,000 fine. Breach of Regulation 3 of the Management of the Health and Safety at Work regulations, that was another £10,000. Regulations that you should all be familiar with, um, the CDM regs, which I'm sure you're sick of hearing about. Again, £10,000 fine under that legislation. And then finally, the work at height regulations, another £10,000. So it, 
£40,000 um, fine in total. So moving on, think about the, the PSNI um, aspect of things. Look, the police will conduct their own investigation of any death, but they, will, they also support the other agencies involved quite considerably. Um, they support the health and safety executive, they support the coroner's office. Um, there can be some confusion and, and it's important to seek clarity um, when any of your staff are being interviewed as to whether they're being interviewed under caution by the police or whether, which is quite often the case, the police are simply carrying out um, interviews on behalf of some other agency. So again, it's, it's important to, to be clear um, what the circumstances of any interview are because there's a lot of overlap here. Um, the, the police will take statements from witnesses. Um, the forensic service within the police service tend to do the analysis of any of the evidence at, at, at site. Um, they, they usually take away the, the, the machinery, the plant that's involved for examination. And all of that feeds in to the HSE investigation. But it also forms the basis of the discovery or documentation um, that's available to all of the parties in any coronial inquest to follow. So the PSNI will pass a file to the prosecution service for consideration of whether there is sufficient evidence to support prosecution for one of the more serious criminal offences, um, of which corporate manslaughter is, is key and probably the most serious. Um, if, if the prosecution service decide not to pursue that offence, they can still prosecute for less serious health and safety offences. Um, but just to have a look again, breaking my own rule about listing legislation, um, the Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act 2007. Now, manslaughter is the term in Northern Ireland and in England and Wales, and homicide sounds very American, actually, that's the Scottish term that's involved. But really just taking a quick look at what what the offence is. Um, an organisation to which this section applies is guilty of an offence if the way in which its activities are managed or organised causes the death and amounts to a gross breach of a relevant duty of care. Um, so this is about existing duties. It's not, there's no new law here. This isn't creating sort of new health and safety requirements. Um, it, it, it's just creating an offence where there's a breach of the existing health and safety regime, but it's a very significant breach, a gross breach of duty, and also it causes death. And it, it has to be linked to the, the, the management, the organisation of, of a business. So this is not, this is not sort of one-off rogue freak accident territory at all. Um, it, goes, it goes beyond that. Um, so just to, to delve into that a little deeper, into what the next part of the section says. Um, so an organisation is guilty of an offence under this section. If the way in which its activities are managed or organised by its senior management is a substantial element in the breach referred to above. So again, like not, not one-off rogue employee sort of disregarding rules which are normally very strictly enforced and that people are all familiar with and well trained in. It's something more systemic. Um, so, you know, it's, it, th that's really what territory we're in here. Um, again, moving on, uh, the breach of the duty is gross if it falls far below what's, what could be reasonably expected of an organisation. And interestingly, senior management um, can involve those sort of making the decisions at the top of the tree about how activities are to be managed or someone who's got a more sort of directly operational role who's actually organizing the activities on the ground. Um, so th those people that are further removed from the sort of day-to-day -day activities are, are, not, um, are not off the hook. Okay, so in terms of sentencing guidelines, um, the first time a Northern Irish court sentenced a company for this offense was back in 2012. And Judge Burgess, who's now retired, he gave a very detailed judgment which borrowed quite heavily from the guidance in England and Wales at the time on sentencing. Um, and he basically set out the, the, the following sort of guidance. First of all, the court has to consider how foreseeable was serious injury. So generally, the more foreseeable something was, then the graver the offence. 
So as I've said before, not, not a sort of freak accident, um, but if, if everyone, you know, after the event, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but if it was, if there were real red flags, then um, that's more likely to lead to a finding of, um, of this offence having, having taken place. Um, secondly, how far short of the applicable standard did the defendant fall? So, you know, if it's a, it has to be a really significant breach. Um, thirdly, how common is this type of breach in the organisation? So was it an isolated incident or is it indicative of a systemic departure from good practice across operations? I mean, and that's that's just the general point that I'll come back to, that it, if you're on top of health and safety, if it's something that's sort of drilled into everyone across the organisation, um, if you're able to demonstrate that, then, then you certainly put yourself in a much stronger position and you're much less likely to find, um, find yourself being subject to this, this sort of prosecution. Um, finally, how far up the organisation does the breach go? So again, that this, this is not aimed at, uh, at sort of something that's gone wrong at the bottom of an organisation. It, it really is looking at you know, the, the further up the chain, the knowledge of, of the potential risk and the, the failure to enforce um, the, the rules that everyone knows ought to be enforced, that the further up that goes, the more serious the offence is likely to be. Um, now, he, the judge also set out a number of mitigating factors which are interesting. Um, first of all, taking acceptance of responsibility at an early stage. So it's, it's a little bit like you, you read about, uh, you know, serious crime. If the, if the defendant pleads guilty at an early stage, then you tend to get some uh, reduction in sentence and that, that applies to this. So again, very important to be taking advice as to whether you know whether that's something that ought to be done or considered. Um, high level of cooperate cooperation with the investigation can can be um, you know serve as mitigation. So you know the, the more cooperative you are, the better. Basically, um, a genuine effort to remedy the problem um, will be taken into account. Uh, a good and healthy health and safety record is something that the court will consider. Um, so, you know, if this is, if, if, you, if you do have a good, a good record, you, you haven't ever experienced serious problems, then, then that's something the court will look at. Whereas, by contrast, you know, if you have, um, if you, you start to appear to have a, a problem that there have been a number of incidents, not necessarily death, but um, a number of injuries, a number of incidents, then, then that will weigh against you. Um, and, and generally a responsible attitude to health and safety uh, will go far to persuade the judge to, to sort of minimise the, the, the sentence. And in that particular case, um, a £250,000 fine was, um, was to be applied, but the judge decided to reduce that by 20%, sorry, 25% to reflect the early plea. Um, he also afforded the defendant six months to pay uh, there, there is an element of looking at the financial circumstances of, of the defendant company, and you, you do tend to see, you know, the more significant awards being, uh, or sort of awards, penalties being imposed against the larger organisations. Uh, but that's not to say that, um, you know, the judge will look at, at the balance sheet and say, well, this, this will put their lights out, therefore I'm not going to impose that penalty. If, if it's sufficiently serious, if the problems with, you know, if the company has a real problem with health and safety, then, then the judge may well impose a fine that's sort of um, game over for, for the company. So um, it's just worth, worth bearing in mind. Um, second case study is a, is a corporate manslaughter situation. Again, it's a sense of roofing company um, based in Balamina. Prosecuted for multiple work-related offences, um, including corporate manslaughter following the death of an employee. The incident took place in December 2016. This time it was a 59-year-old who fell through an unsecured section of a roof. There's a bit of a theme emerging here. Um, the work that was being carried out involved overcladding of existing roof structure with new sheeting. And it was held that the company had failed to make suitable and sufficient risk assessment of the work to be carried out. Uh, the roof work wasn't properly planned and safety measures weren't put in place. Uh, and also the company failed to report the incident as a work related death to the health and safety executive. So that was also actionable as a breach. 
um, looking at the, the, the charge sheet here, just going through um, the breach of Article 4 of the Health and Safety at Work order resulted in a £5,000 fine. Um, the management of the Health and Safety at Work regs, another £5,000. The Work at Height regs, £5,000. Another regulation of the Work at Height regs, £5,000. Um, Article 3 of RIDOR, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, which is um, related to reporting incidents. Um, that resulted in a £5,000 fine. And then under the Corporate Manslaughter Act, the fine was £50,000. So that was a grand total of £75,000, which is you know, not insignificant, um, but it was also obviously relative to the size of the, the company involved. Um, now, moving on to think about the, the coronial inquest stage of this process, um, the coroner has a discretion over whether to conduct an inquest or not, um, except in very limited circumstances where it's compulsory, um, again, usually involving deaths in custody. Uh, but generally, deaths in the workplace will result in an inquest um, unless the family aren't particularly enthusiastic. And it's obvious from the statements and the medical notes what has happened. Uh, but you know, I would say that nine times out of 10, there will be an inquest following a, a death in a workplace. The inquest is inquisitorial in nature, so it's a fact-finding investigation by the coroner into the circumstances of the death. Um, it's, it's not supposed to be about attributing blame. Um, the focus is to establish a very basic point, who the deceased was and how, when and where they died. So that's you know, it's a fairly narrow focus. But there's also sort of wider public interest that the that the inquest has to serve, and one of one of those um, points is drawing attention to circumstances which, if unremedied, might lead to further deaths. So it's really about sort of whether there are any lessons to be learned from the circumstances of the death. Um, but as I said, it's not supposed to be about pointing the finger, and um, certainly not supposed to be about formal liability being established. But obviously. Um, what emerges from an inquest, the facts that emerge can inform um, any actions to follow. So it, it is important, um, again, that you have support during that. Now, some firms find that they're, they're not, their insurance um, doesn't cover inquests, whereas it clearly it obviously covers um, any civil proceedings. Um, it, it, but it, it, it depends on the extent of your cover. It is possible to, to get insurance which covers the, the inquest process, but, but quite often when I'm um, advising clients involved in an inquest, they're self-funding, um, so they're not insured. And there, there can be a bit of a debate as to whether it's worth you know, getting involved, whether it's, it's worth participating fully in the proceedings. And obviously I would say this, but it, it, it's even when you know it, it appears that there's nothing that's going to be really relevant coming out in relation to your your involvement. Um, these things can just change course quite dramatically. So it, it, it's important, I feel, to, to, to have a presence and to be involved in the process. Um, I mean, for example, I have an ongoing inquest um, on behalf of a, a global manufacturer of a product um, or a piece of machinery. And when the when the inquest process kicked off, um, the, the forensic evidence that the police had put together had suggested that there was some sort of design flaw in the brakes of this piece of machinery. Um, so we, we got our own expert evidence or expert engineer to look at it and it, you know, it was completely wrong. And there was, the, the expert was able to establish a completely separate um, cause of the incident um, but I mean if that had been left unchecked you know or if that had developed in the course of of the proceedings and, and the, the company weren't represented then that could have resulted in quite damaging findings being made so it, it does it, it does pay to sort of be involved there um, now it's the next of kin and anyone who might be in some way responsible or could be subject to any criticism in the inquest will be designated as a properly interested person or a PIP. And you can choose to accept that status or not. You can choose to participate or not. Um, but again, it, you know, my view is that it is wise to take that opportunity. And really all that means is that um, if, you're a, if you're a PIP 
then you are afforded the opportunity to participate fully in the inquest. You're given access to all of the documents that the coroner is, is going to rely on. You see all of the witness statements um, and you're involved in all of the, the pre-action hearings uh, leading up to the inquest, as well as being given the opportunity to question witnesses at the, at the inquest. Um, in, the, in terms of procedure, it's quite an open process, um, but there initially is a, a disclosure process where all of the parties receive relevant material. Uh, there might be a, a request for, for further, further documentation or for access to, to witnesses um, for the purposes of taking further statements. Um, the witness list is, is agreed um, at a preliminary hearing and the witnesses are summoned and then at the inquest itself, it's usually held in a courtroom uh, close to where the family are based, if that's, if that's possible. Uh, although we have challenges at the moment um, because of COVID, uh, I have another inquest where there are so many parties that we, we haven't been able to identify a courtroom large enough to allow people to physically attend and to socially distance. So that, that's causing some, some problems in terms of scheduling. Um, but basically the witnesses are examined, first of all, by the coroner. And the coroner can examine witnesses, him or herself. Uh, generally, the coroner will have a solicitor representing him or her, or her uh, and a barrister. So that, that team interviews a witness first. Then the, the PIPs each have the opportunity to, to cross-examine the, the witness. And then the, if the witness, him or herself, is is uh, represented separately, which can happen if there's a conflict between um, the, the business and an employee, for example, they may feel they want to take their own uh, legal advice, then finally that they, they carry out the, the final examination. Um, and in terms of uh, findings, um, what, you know, what the coroner actually delivers at the end of the day is, is basically just a factual narrative of who, where, how, um, and as I said, you know, it's, it's not supposed to be um, about liability. It's not supposed to touch on liability, but inevitably there can be facts that emerge that, that form um, views and form, form decisions as to whether to take things forward. The, the coroner can also refer, make a referral to um, a person or authority who might have some power to take action to prevent the problem happening again so that could be a government body or the chief medical officer um, the the coroner can also make a, a reference to the director of public prosecutions if if it's felt that a criminal offense might have occurred so you know even if the initial police investigation um, didn't result in a, a prosecution um, that isn't necessarily the end of the road because if if there are facts that emerge in the course of an inquest, that caused the coroner to, to come to a different view, then, then he or she could take that step um, of their own volition uh, to refer that on. Um, again, look, important to, to look at being represented there. So we, we've looked at the, the health and safety investigation stage and that can result in prosecutions. We've looked at the PSNI investigation and that can result in more serious prosecutions. We've looked at the inquest stage um, which can result in bindings, which may or may not be problematic um, for an organisation. And so the final part of the um, saga uh, could be a civil claim uh, for damages um, by the family. Now, this could again be a whole seminar in itself, but I'm just going to give a, a bit of an overview. Um, so in, in contrast to what we've discussed with the inquest process, civil proceedings are all about who is to blame? It's all about causation. Um, so you you know you're looking at but for the particular breach, um, would the death or injury have occurred? So it's all about causation. Um, expert evidence can be key in in a civil claim, um, you know, and and often they can come down to you know a battle of the experts, um, and the, the judge has to sort of decide between. To competing views. I mean, experts have significant duties to the court. Um, the, the days of the hired gun have, have, are supposed to be gone, um, and the, the current high court judges have, have very clear guidance um, for, for the, any, any expert witness in terms of the duties and the declarations that they have to, 
sign, but it, it can be very important. Um, but like in terms of damages, um, fatal accidents, NI order um, allows the family to claim what's known as a bereavement award. And it's a fixed sum, um, which which sort of is is increased um, every few years or so. At the moment, it's fifteen thousand one hundred pounds, um, which is the sort of award to reflect the loss of society, as we would you know, call it previously. Um, but what what can be the more significant element of of a claim is basically future losses, loss of earnings. Um, obviously, if you know a death involves a relatively young person. Um, who would have been providing for a family for you know the rest of their career, um, then then that can be a significant sum of money, um, and there are all sorts of complicated calculations that that take place, um, which I won't bore you with to to reflect you know what what could or or what may or may not have happened in that person's life. But you know, needless to say, as a as a general point, um, you know, those those claims can be can be very very significant in value um, and rightly so um so just just to sum up then um what we've been through and the sort of key points that i would make for you and, and sort of ask you to take away from today health and safety has to be at the forefront of everything you do um and i know like i mean health and safety legislation it just seems to change by the day there, there is so much information involved um value your health and safety people because they are they, they perform such an important role um but it has to really be something that's part of the culture uh, particularly in industries such as a construction industry where you you know unfortunately what you do just has an inherent level of of risk um, it you know it's it's, it's not like us sit, sitting in our office and walking up and down to court. You, you know there is always going to be an element of risk in what you do. So managing that risk has to be front and center. Um, well organized, accessible records are so important. Uh, you know I just breathe a sigh of relief if I'm involved in a case like this and you find that you've got a well organized health and safety manager who knows where everything is and it's all it's all easy to easy to access it just it makes compliance with the various requirements um, that we've discussed so much easier um, and it, it just again helps you demonstrate um, that that you are a good you know health and safety employer conscious employer um, there's no use having that in practice but you can't you can't put your hand to where that policy is you know it's there somewhere so so that that's really really important um as our sort of regular policy reviews um there's no use having a policy which becomes totally outdated uh, or that nobody actually reads or knows about um and i think we're all guilty of sort of you know a bit of a tick box attitude to to things like this where you see right we've got that policy tech and put that put that in a folder somewhere you know that that's not really helpful um also internal controls just to ensure that compliance is taking place um you know as i've said there's no use having a, a wonderful procedure if if nobody follows it so um making sure that that's something that you're you know this has to be proactively managed it's not it's it's too late when you're reacting to a problem um like significant financial consequences if we get this stuff wrong, unfortunately. Um, you know, leaving aside the the human uh, aspect of it, which is is obviously really important and and awful, but um, look, it can have a significant financial impact on a business. So, um, from that point of view, you know, it's it's really important. Direct personal consequences for senior management, which usually gets you know gets people's attention. Uh, this is not just. Um, something that can result in a fine or um, a financial uh, penalty that you know there, there are there are repercussions for directors um, there is some exposure to personal um, liability or prosecutions um, there can be there, there can be sort of dis directors disqualification issues um, arising so it's very very important that you know it's not enough to just delegate this to someone and then forget about it you you do have to sort of make sure that it's something that that your senior management team are across and finally I feel like a bit of a broken record here but the earlier you take advice the better um because once you start to go down a road 
with an investigation it, it can be very difficult to to roll back from that so um you know get getting a bit of support as soon as you can um is is important uh and like that was a bit of a whistle stop tour i know that there, there's a lot in that um i'm going to take a wee look at the see if i can work this out um if there's anyone who has any questions everybody's been, been very very coy with their questions Kirsten, but, I, you know, know. I think that's a reflection of the, the detail you've gone into that that's, that's been tremendous um information to structure back i mean my, my takeaway from that are yeah you're right as an industry there are inherent risks and, and as an industry we've come a very long way to manage those but obviously you, you can't afford to take your eye away from it and i think the responsibility you're, you're absolutely right the responsibility is top and bottom of every business this doesn't just reflect what happens on the the site you know health and safety is a culture and we know absolutely. that now and it's something that we're, we're all embedding so i think that's tremendous uh, to get through all of that, as you said, I have no actual questions unless anybody wants to pop one in very quickly. Right. Um, I'm happy to answer. If anyone wants to just contact me um, offline, look, I realise that this this is is a sensitive area. Um, and if you have any concerns, then feel free. My my details are up there. Feel free to drop me an email or or give me a call, and I, we can have a chat. And we will follow up tomorrow uh, with everybody who was online today and give them the details again. And I think that's the very best advice. It's, it's a moving picture. There's always new new information. So if anybody finds themselves in these unfortunate circumstances or wants to to, to improve their planning to avoid them, um, they know where to go, Carson. So thank you very much. We really Not appreciate you giving your time this morning. Appreciate Bill Selig's support throughout the year. Uh, all our previous webinars are on the CDF uh, YouTube channel. And bookings are open for the remainder of the, the mill selling program uh, going into next year. So, with that, we'll thank you all for attending. Hope you find it useful. Uh, and again, Kirsten and Mill Selling, thank you very much for hosting that today. Thank you for having us, Mark. And thanks everyone for coming along.